The Lord be with you. Good morning. Welcome on this gorgeous spring morning. Uh, last week was cold and rainy, and now we're going to be in the 80s. So, you know, everybody gets their <laughs> tissues out, I think. Um, so we welcome again Dr. Mattis with us, uh, who will be leading us through the Reformation um, this week. And then next week, we'll end with our third lecture with her. So glad to have you here. Uh, my announcement this morning is that the 21st will be our last adult formation um, oh. se se oh. session of this academic year. But worry not, because we will be back in September. We've got a whole lot of really... That's the ninth month. <laughs> the, you could have some time. The, you know, <laughs> take a vacation, you, you know, get a tan, but come I'm back well rested. Let the formation well. settle in. <laughs> Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And we have all kinds of fun things to look forward to in the fall, dessert and dialogue and, uh, you know, fun programs like that. So um, come back. Let us open with a word of prayer and then I will turn it over to the professor. Gracious God, we thank you for yet another day to gather together. May we take what we learn here, let it ruminate within our hearts and our minds and our souls. And may we take it out into the world to be better followers of your way. May we be blessed to be a blessing. In the name of the Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Take it away. Well, <laughs> don't take it. So um, the, the one um, that I think I'm going to carry over from last time, I know a lot of you were here, but not everybody was. Um, so, the one, so the one bit of sort of reminder, which I think we'll do, is uh, at the Council of Nicaea in 325, if you remember, um, a bunch of bishops got together and produced, in the end, the thing that we call the Nicene Creed, which some of you, again, may have grown up <laughs> reciting, or as you remember, it's a statement about, uh, about where Christ fits, that he is fully divine and on a par with the Father. Okay, so far so good. For our purposes, one of the most important things about that council, though, is it is the granddaddy of all church councils. And it provides a model that is not just religious, but political. Because um, if you remember, it was the Emperor Constantine who called it. And Constantine sat at the head of the table, as it were, while all the bishops had to come up with a kind of definition. So it established a precedent for a church council in which bishops and king, uh, or Roman emperor in this case, uh, worked together. And that became a model that has kind of, that because Nicaea is so important in the history of Christianity, that model for a king being involved in some capacity um, is one that has remained hugely important within the Christian tradition. Um, even after, so, so I, I can't sort of cover all of the sort of intervening years between uh, last week and this week, but um, all the linguistic stuff that we were talking about last week um, means that East and West gradually go their separate ways. Um, the Western half of the empire uh, falls uh, around, again, throughout the fifth century, the variety of things that happens. Um, but in the East, the Roman empire remains the Roman empire. They just speak Greek more, which we were talking about last time. Um, and that continues to be the model of the, the Roman emperor, who is also effectively head of his church. And there are fancy long names for that, but the bottom line is the model that was set in 325 is the one that continued to be hugely important. Um, so, but in the meantime, there is cultural linguistic drift, you can call it that, between the Eastern and Western halves of the empire. As I say, really, it's down to language and it's down to cultural differences and it's down to lots of other bits and pieces. Um, by the time nobody, I mean, people were formally in schism and, and, and then came back together again and the church agreed and disagreed. And, and, and uh, but things were always technically resolved until the year 1054. And I'm only mentioning this just again, just for continuity's sake. When there was a spat that everybody thought would be resolved like all the other ones had been before, except that it never was. Um, so if you want the formal date of split or schism between the Eastern and Western halves of Christendom, 1054 is when it happens. Um, 
the uh, city of Constantinople would continue to stand and be a Christian city uh, all the way, all the way, all the way until 1453. Um, where it finally falls to Mehmet the Conqueror, Mehmet II, and the Ottoman Empire in 1453. Now, this is important because you'll notice that we've now got into territory that the dates are a bit closer than they were before. Um, the backdrop to a lot of what happens, believe it or not, in the Reformation is a world in which um, the Ottomans were actually doing quite well. Um, the Ottomans were taking territory. They finally captured Constantinople. Constantinople. They even besieged Vienna. They would get so far as to besiege Vienna. And according to the legend, that's how coffee drinking comes to Vienna. Um, so, you know, good things happen even in, uh, but, uh, but uh, so yeah, Viennese, Viennese coffee culture claims that that's where it comes from. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so, the, the specter, if you will, of Ottoman and Islamic conquest hangs over a lot of what will happen in this period and is a kind of nervous backdrop. Um, and it's important partly because uh, the church is worried about it, the Catholic, meaning the Catholic church is worried about it, but a lot of our uh, little pe our, our people will be as well. And, um, and it, so I don't know if you talk much about uh, things called, for example, the doctrine of discovery and the language that shapes how we talk about Native Americans, how we talk about a lot of that comes out of these dynamics of Islamic conquest. They didn't intend for them to be, but that's what happens. So again, I'm just mentioning it to note it and we can come back to it if you would like me to talk about it more. Okay, so um, I want you to imagine the world that our friend Martin Luther was born into. Um, this is the, medi the medieval world of Western Christendom, we'll call it that. It was a world in which um, when you were born, you were baptized on day eight and everyone was born into the church automatically. There were no choices. So if you look at say like a parish graveyard, everybody's born, buried, and died there, you know, and you can look at the sort of graves that go back generations upon generations. There's just solid continuity. There's one parish church, everybody's born, baptized, married, buried, um, all in one place. So there aren't options in the way that we think of. Uh, and that's the sort of old medieval model there were moments, so the sort of Catholic, this is still the sort of system within the Catholic, uh, within the Catholic church today, that your life was punctuated by sort of seven, uh, by, by seven sacraments, the most important of which was the Eucharist, um, Holy Communion, uh, baptism and Holy Communion, but um, they counted other things as well, including marriage or holy orders if you became a priest, but also including last rites and penance and various other bits and pieces. So you have a system in which there were seven sacraments um, and, very, and again, various groups of people engaged with the church at various points, but everybody was part of the same thing. That didn't mean that everybody always agreed by any means. Um, precisely because the Catholic Church was this huge big tent. Actually, there's a lot of diversity in practice that simply had to occur because they had to include everybody. Um, it's, we often think of the papacy as being, um, uh, it, it, the papacy in this period, <laughs> there are real tensions in the papacy in this period, indeed throughout the whole history of the papacy in the Catholic Church. The papacy has never really been able to make up its mind between whether it wanted to be an international arbiter of faith and morals or whether it wanted to be the king of Rome <laughs> um, and, and specifically king of central Italy um, because it did own outright a, a significant chunk of central Italy. In fact, the, the re when, when Italy became a country, which is again, much later than we tend to remember, late 19th century, they actually had to take everything away from the papacy 
in order to make Italy as we now understand it, because the papacy just owned most of the stuff in the middle. And if they were going to join up the bits in the north and bits in the south, they had to take it all away from the papacy, which is partly why Vatican City is the smallest country in the world. Um, and speaking of which, the, apparently in within the Vatican, you, if you go to an ATM in the Vatican, the, the standard language is Latin if you go to a, an ATM in the Vatican, which is kind of hilarious. Uh, but, um, but yeah, uh, at the time, at the time, uh, Italy was, if you know anything about the Italian Renaissance, Italy was a collection of little fighting, competing city-states uh, that all <coughs> sort of hated each other and had various allegiances beyond Italy. Even today, I think if you ask any Italian where they're from, they'll tell you the city that they're from. Mm -hmm. They don't, they tend not to say that they're Italian. Um, it's no, we're, we're, uh, we're from Venice or we're, Ven we're Venetian or we're Roman or we're, but they don't, Nobody actually, actually, I have friends of mine who say that they're citizens of the EU. They don't say that they're Italian. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, Italy is an interesting question. Um, the bottom line is, though, that um, all of these little competing city states meant that the papacy was sort of one more in that mix, which meant that every now and again you'd get a pope who actually really wanted to, um, as I say, stand for something bigger, broader, and to be a kind of international figure. The problem is, is the politics that the papacy inherited was always dragging it back into the mess and the snake pit that was Italian politics. Um, and they kept getting sort of distracted by that, I would say. Um, so the papacy had gone through a particularly bad time in which actually two different figures both claimed to be pope and they couldn't resolve this. And there was war at the time and this dragged on for much of the 14th century. Uh, so we went through a period where there were two and actually at times three popes before it could be resolved. The bottom line is the papacy is not as static an institution as we often think. Um, and again, had its ups and downs. And it wasn't the case that there was no <laughs> efforts to try to change it. Um, they were ongoing um, and from a variety of circles. The problem is if you have a top down system, how do you fix the top? Um, if you have an institution that is built that way, how to actually, how to trace it all the way up to the top is really, really difficult. And, and so um, the church in fixing the schism that I just told you about where there are multiple popes, the church tried to call a council. So that, that ghost was resurrected because a council is, you know, within the Christian tradition, the council is the great answer to how you fix the top. <laughs> the problem is, is popes knew that, and uh, actually, after they fixed it once, no pope ever really wanted to call another council because he was afraid of what would happen. <laughs> so, by the time you get to 15, say 16 or 17, you've got a situation where um, the papacy is thoroughly enmeshed, as I said, in all of these Italian politics. They, um, there are plenty of people who want to reform the church, but the papacy doesn't particularly want to work with any of them because um, of what might happen. Uh, but a on, and it would have been Allhallows Eve, so Halloween in 1517, mm. our friend Martin Luther uh, gets a bee in his bonnet about something that had been going on, uh, which I'll go back and talk about in just a second, and nailed the so-called 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg in Germany mm -hmm. and kicks off the so-called Protestant Reformation. And so let's unpack that a bit. So um, Luther was a minor's son. He was um, the son of a very self-made man. Um, he had become a priest. He'd been caught in a thunderstorm, so goes the story. Thought he was going to die, said, St. Anne, save me, I will become a monk didn't die in the thunderstorm and became an Augustinian friar, meaning he was um, a preacher trained in a very particular order. He was a priest. Um, he uh, he well, apparently was very, we would say conscientious. He was someone who would go to confession six, seven times a day if he could. Um, clearly Luther's mental health can fill whole <laughs> libraries. Um, you know, psych, psycho, uh, <laughs> the psychiatrists have lots of fun with Luther. Um, but uh, he, he was a sensitive soul. Um, he doesn't always come off that way, but um, he was, I think, at bottom, a sensitive soul who really struggled with his own sense of unworthiness, 
and with how he, how the church dealt with his own and other people's sense of unworthiness. But he was trained as a priest. Um, and he was trained within a very particular order who read lots of Augustine. As I say, he was an Augustinian friar. Um, the main thing he, the thing that really, really annoyed him um, was that, again, for a variety of reasons, which we don't have time to go into, um, the papacy's best way of raising short-term cash, um, including to build the present-day St. Peter's Cathedral, mm -hmm. Um, was what are called indulgences, which were these certificates. So he would go to a priest. Um, and again, I don't know if any of you were raised Catholic, if this is going to sound familiar to any of you, but if you go to a priest and you'd say, okay, I've done this wrong and I've done this wrong and I've done this wrong. Forgiveness from God is free. The church actually was never, they never made any bones about that. But often in the Catholic church, they would say, right, you're forgiven, that's free, but you have to make restitution. <laughs> Um, and <laughs> well, exactly. And often that would be money. Exactly. Yeah. Often that would be money. So um, this is also a system at this point that believed very powerfully in purgatory, um, that there would be heaven and hell, but then there would be, if you were repentant, but you just weren't perfected yet, you would be in this middle state where you would be gradually um, brought to perfection. Nobody thought that this would be fun. Uh, and so, uh, when you, this is partly why there's a tradition of praying for the dead in the Catholic tradition. Um, also, even so in, in my in the Anglican tradition that I'm a part of, um, prayers for the dead are a thing. Not because we don't, not because God doesn't know where they are, because we don't know where they are, but because we think that they're getting slowly um, perfected. The problem with this system, the way that it, and it became a system, um, was that the church was saying, if you give us a set sum of money, this will help to shorten that period of time in purgatory. <laughs> it's the restitution part, not the forgiveness. And the problem is, is even though technically you weren't buying the forgiveness of God, when these things were getting sold on the street mm. by people like Dominican friars saying, pay us a sum of money and this will shorten your, your dead auntie's time in purgatory, um, it sounded like you're buying God's forgiveness. And this is what made Luther really, really, really properly pissed off. Uh, and this is what, and this is what kicked off. <laughs> that's the technical term for it. Um, uh, so then from here on out, so one of the things that's interesting about the Reformation is that Luther, Luther's a priest. He didn't actually want to leave the Catholic Church. What he wanted to do is have a debate. The problem is, is that the institution was so set in its ways and so defensive that when Luther tries to have this conversation, um, he gets pushback and defensiveness and the church, as I said, which doesn't want to call a council and doesn't want to talk about this stuff. He meets both with rigidity, defensiveness and opposition until by 1520, he's excommunicated and forced out of the church. So he tries to work within the church. Ultimately, this doesn't work. And from here on out, he's a free agent which is where we learn. This is the new world of Luther because Luther was something of a genius mass communicator. Um, when I talk to students about Luther, I actually think there's a lot of resonance between say, between Luther and kind of the, the way that we talk about sort of talk show hosts. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Um, like if you go on the internet, you can look up Luther. There's a there's a so-called Lutheran insult generator. Have you seen this? <laughs> if you Google Lutheran insult generator, uh, up will come up will come our friend, and if you just hit a button, it will uh, give you a quote, an extract from Luther's works, um, <laughs> because um, he was very good at insulting people, and there are many 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 examples that the uh, generator can draw upon. Um, first and foremost, Luther is German. And he's writing in German and he's writing in German in a very punchy, um, combat. He's great fun to read. When I give him my students, they, they always love reading it, whether they agree with him or not. He's always great fun to read, um, because he's lively. And as I say, there is something about <coughs> him. He, he's a genius at connecting with his people, um, for Germans who'd been used to being ignored. This was electrifying. And um, he's talking to poor people. He is being honest about where he thinks the church is messing up. He is, and he viscerally, um, he, he talks about um, 
a lot of the systems of the church that he thought had gone wrong. And the center of the Lutheran experience is this belief that it is um, Luther's great model is the Apostle Paul. Luther, in so many ways, was profoundly influenced by Paul, was trying to be Paul <laughs> uh, in so many ways. And the core of that experience, right? Remember, I told you that he was conscientious and was sort of constantly fretting about like where he was at, salvation, anxiety, whether he was doing everything right, um, that it is not by works, but by the grace of God that we are saved. Um, ironically, actually, everybody will, everybody thinks this in the end, um, but, uh, but again, it's not, it wasn't necessarily what was taught, um, that, that grace is the free gift of God given to us that we do not deserve in the sense, I mean, not in the sense that we're bad people, we just don't, what the gift that is given us completely outweighs, um, you know, who we are, and it is a free gift of God, absolutely. Um, for Luther, this free gift of grace from God um, freed him from his crippling sense of guilt, um, and it was this profound, we would say, evangelical conversion experience. Um, and this has been the sort of core of the Protestant religious experience ever since. The other piece of this, though, is because this, this experience happened while Luther was reading the Bible. So scripture is the other piece. Um, and Luther, over the course of his life, would translate the Bible into German. Um, this is one of those things that wherever we go in the Reformation is going to be important. Wherever the Reformation goes, people tend to turn their back on prayers for the dead and the, and the saints. Um, and instead are looking for this in, almost this individual one-on-one -on -one personal encounter with Christ. But they're often doing that in the context of a close encounter with and through and by scripture that is in the vernacular, in the language that they speak. Because up to now, the Bible had been in Latin. It didn't mean that people didn't know what it said, but, but they didn't read the Bible for themselves. And so, you know, with that injunction to read the Bible for themselves will come literacy, will come lots of other things um, that, that sort of go in its way. Uh, but everywhere the Reformation goes, Everywhere the Reformation goes, there will be vernacular scriptures, a translation of the Bible into the language that people speak. And the effect that that has in practice, actually, is that the Bible, in whatever language it's translated into, will help to set or crystallize um, the language that is being spoken at the time. So it's this sort of really fascinating language feedback loop. If you care about languages and literature, um, if you translate, so Luther's Bible translated into German will help to set German um, in terms of how it's spelled, in terms of how it's spoken. German's a very, very dialecty language and, and Luther's German becomes really the core of Luther, what will become Germany. Germany, like Italy, doesn't become a country till very, very late. But Luther's Bible is like the core of German national identity. Um, and the same is true for what will become um, uh, Tyndale's translation of the Bible into mm -hmm. English. Um, so, you know, if you, uh, when people study Shakespeare, they're always fascinated by the fact that Shakespeare spells his name about six different ways. It's because uh, he was just playing around and spelling conventions weren't set that early. Um, but, but the Bible, if you're reading the Bible and words are spelled a certain way in the Bible, they help, you know, they just become influential. So, so there are all these sort of knock on linguistic effects that happen in the Reformation that, that are political and that are really connected to national identity. And so the Reformation has all these political consequences. So what starts out as a religious movement very quickly moves into politics. Um, and you can't really escape that. And the two are always, always tied together. Um, so Luther's message, for example, um, and this is true in good and bad ways. The good ways are what I've described, that it really helps um, uh, regions have a very, have a set, have their, have a language, have a core of uh, identity that they, and, and will help people read the Bible for themselves. Um, Luther's message of grace rather than works um, is seen by many poor people as an opportunity to overthrow uh, the systems that had been in place that were oppressing them. And so there is this anarchic side to the Reformation. 
And this really scares Luther because um, in Germany, where he lives, Germany is very, very politically disunited at this time. And the person that who is technically the Holy Roman Emperor, the person who's head of Germany, is a Catholic. And the only reason that Luther is still alive is because the Lord of his little local area is protecting him, which means Luther needs the politicians on his side if he's going to make it. Um, which means that when people start taking his messages and using them as a warrant for political uprising, Luther gets very, very, very scared. Uh, and there's a very, there's a treatise in the 1520s called Against the Robbing Murderous Hordes of German Peasants, which tells you about what Luther thinks um, <laughs> about, uh, about people using his teachings as a warrant for political rebellion. Um, it will be the people who are doing the uprising will actually become uh, eventually by many removes um, they will actually become the ancestors of today's modern Mennonites. The, the, the Anabaptists will become mm -hmm. the Mennonites. But for all that they um, look quaint to us now, they were the anarchists and the radicals of their day. And they were persecuted and executed by everybody who could get their hands on them, which is why so many of them came here. Um, mm -hmm. Because they really were completely outside the sort of political system of the 16th century. So, so there is a real tension in Luther between the part of him that is anarchic, the part of him that is bottom up, the part of him that is a rebel, and the part of him that doesn't want there to be social disorder and can't afford for there to be social disorder and actually will work with political authority um, all the time. And that's, that's the sort of twin legacy of the Reformation. And it repeats itself over and over and over that the only thing that's going to be big enough and mean enough to go up against the powers that were, or the powers that are, um, are going to be these close cooperative alliances between the reformers and certain people within the Reformation, namely kings, which puts us right back here. Mm -hmm. um, that, that the cooperation between ruler and theologian that was the model for Nicaea gets repeated in a lot of ways. And as I say, it's the Ur model that everybody always runs back to anyway. So we get this in a variety of ways. So Luther, our friend, um, early, early, uh, and dies, uh, dies in 1546. Precisely because Luther's, Luther's movement actually very quickly goes beyond him. And one of the ironies of the Reformation, I think, is that Luther, Luther becomes a symbol of his movement, even in his own time. Mm -hmm. um, and be precisely because Luther is loud and aggressive and um, colorful and a little bit lower class. Um, he very quickly, I mean, even now, I think we know him as the person that starts the Reformation, but I don't know how much more than that we often know. Like he's made a symbol very quickly rather than, I think we use him as a symbol more than we read him, if that makes sense, because he has rough edges. Um, one of the things that's really awkward about Luther for Germans and for, for everybody else is Luther's anti-Semitism. Um, that's the most uncomfortable thing about Luther and you can't get away from it. You can't shy away from it. You gotta deal with it. And, um, and so, so yeah, Luther very quickly, part, partly also, he is so German <laughs> that that doesn't necessarily translate too well beyond Germany. So we know he starts the Reformation but, and he is explosively popular in Germany, but his influence kind of stops at the German border. Um, so, so what we see, this is the other thing that will happen in the information, is that, um, is that there isn't gonna be one leader of the Reformation. There's gonna be lots, uh, practically by definition. Um, and it will be uh, um, constrained, determined, for, by regional, often linguistic elements, um, that there will be, so there's a national quality, and people often talk about that with a, so instead of one big Western Christendom that's, that's sort of regional, but that's sort of united, um, the Reformation is key to national identity in the way that we know about it. So, um, and this is particularly important for the history of Presbyterian tradition in England, um, but in a couple of other places as well. So I'm just gonna, um, be, but, but at the same time, sorry, at the same time, many of the people who are the early evangelicals, the early Protestants are very international. 
in their outlook. Um, many of them were merchants. Many of them were connected on the continent. They had people that they knew. Uh, and many of them spend lots of time abroad in exile, doing a variety of things. So they're often quite international people in their outlook. So Luther is German. There are lots of other German reformers uh, within Germany that will be important. Um, Zwingli, uh, Huldrich, which is quite, a, again, Swiss German, Huldrich Zwingli in, uh, in Switzerland will be another early follower of the Reformation. And Zwingli is important. So he's in Switzerland which is its own, at the time, it's everyone, I think, I think in Europe finds Swiss neutrality to be a bit ironic um, because in this period, the main thing that they produced were mercenary soldiers. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, you know, it's a mountainous country. Um, there's not a lot of, you know, if you're, if you're an able-bodied man, you kind of had to find work elsewhere. And a lot of them went into the, the army. So the Swiss, the Swiss pike, uh, yeah, there, there were mercenary soldiers uh, in there. And uh, actually, Zwingli will die in the battlefield, um, which is why he dies young, even though he's younger than Luther. Um, but the main thing that's important for us is that Zwingli and the Swiss uh, come to a very different appreciation of the Eucharist than Luther had done. Um, Luther was a priest, as I said, remained a, pri um, remained a priest, and Luther is unwilling throughout his life for all that he doesn't like indulgences and he doesn't like lots of aspects of the Christian tradition. He doesn't like, sorry, doesn't like lots of aspects of the Catholic teaching uh, on the sacraments. He still believes there's what we would call real presence in the Eucharist, and he never, um, he never wants to let that go. Um, with the result that, again, if you watch the coronation, um, for, did, did any of you watch the, the Eucharistic service at the end? Mm -hmm. Did it feel Catholic to many of you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the Lutheran and the Anglican traditions still hold to real presence. They don't define it, or at least not in the Anglican tradition, they don't. But, it, but it, if you're coming from a Presbyterian tradition, it feels very high. Mm -hmm. um, it compared to what you're probably used to. Um, so again, without, I'm not a specialist, and we're going to run out of time if I go into this too, too much, but um, the, there was a real tension in the doctrine of the Eucharist or the sacrament um, of communion um, between whether it is fundamentally, whether it is, uh, whether, Oh, Lordy. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to say this as simply as I can. Um, whether the, when the priest says the, uh, the words of consecration, that the real presence of Christ is there in the sacrament um, in a real and tangible way, um, or if fundamentally what it is is a symbol and a, and a memorial, um, imitating uh, what Christ uh, does and all, all everything is tied to the Last Supper and the and and the text of Scripture. All all are scriptural. The question is just sort of what you make of it from there. Um, the Catholic Church and the Catholic Church um, in the old days, uh, the whole service had been in Latin. The priest would even have celebrated the Eucharist with his back to the congregation. So and he would have muttered the words. He would have said the words quietly. Mm -hmm. um, so, so uh, here's some trivia for you. So actually um, the phrase hocus pocus magic mm -hmm. is from hocus corpus man, this is my body. Um, because this, this sounded like you're doing magic. Um, and that's what people thought. Yeah, so um, which tells you a lot about, about what people thought were going on. Uh, yeah, uh, so you, know, you move from a world where there is a high altar, but the only person who can celebrate um, is the priest and under very particular conditions and there are very particular privileges attached to it. Uh, and then you move to the <laughs> Lutheran faith. Um, he still wants there to be, um, he still wants there to be power connected to the sacrament. And nobody thinks the sacrament is not important. Everybody thinks the sacrament is important, but how, like where in that importance lies, um, everybody is different on this across the Reformation. Zwingli in the Swiss camp is much more, um, sees the, the, the bread and wine as being much more symbolic. Uh, this is a very tricky word. When we say symbol, what do we mean? But, um, but fundamentally he sees uh, 
he sees, and I saw this on your altar in the chapel, at least I haven't been in your sanctuary, but, but see, fundamentally sees the Eucharist as a memorial. Um, do this in remembrance of me. That, that's the piece of the sacrament that's really, really important to the Swiss. Um, and this will continue to be important because the Swiss position will influence what happens in England mm -hmm. um, and which will then in turn get passed down into the Presbyterian tradition. So, uh, okay. Did he influence Henry VIII? Did he broke away? So, okay, exactly. You're doing my transition for me. Okay, so um, in the midst of all this, we have a good old fashioned succession crisis in England. Um, Henry VIII had been king since the, like, you know, whatever it is. Um, 1558. No, sorry. Wrong one. I was going to say. 1548. <laughs> I think I'm trying to think. So actually, the funny thing about Henry VIII is that he was never meant to be king at all. Do you know this? His older brother died. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. So Henry VII mm -hmm. um, is the sovereign that puts an end to the so-called Wars of the Roses, right. um, which is, so if you know the Wars of the Roses, white rose, red rose, which means right. if you look at the so-called Tudor rose, it's a white rose and a red rose. And that's like the dynasty's um, corporate logo. Um, it's saying we ended this. This is why we. This is why we are on the throne. Um, and uh, it says something about uh, his father that he named his eldest son Arthur. That says something about his dynastic ambitions. Um, and he got Arthur engaged to a very nice young woman named Catherine of Aragon, who also <laughs> happened to be the daughter of the wealthiest sovereigns in Europe at the time, who were Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain who had made tons of money um, because they kicked the, the Muslims out of Granada, had a ton of money, which then they used to finance Christopher Columbus. Um, and then they were profiting off silver from the new world, which they were bringing back to Spain. So prodigally wealthy. Um, and uh, Catherine of Aragon brought with her this enormous dowry to England. Um, and Henry VII thought this was great and all was set to go, except that Arthur died. Um, so they were formally, they were formally, I think, even betrothed, but they were like early teenagers at the time. Um, and, and so then Arthur dies unexpectedly. Nobody was ready for it. Huge blow to the dynasty. Um, Henry VIII had had this education. He, he was the spare, right? He was the, uh, <laughs> yeah, in all of this. Um, and so all of a sudden, okay, Henry's going to become king, but Henry VII had to figure out what the heck he was going to do um with Catherine does he marry her to Henry and keep the dowry which is ultimately what he decides to do uh but Catherine so so at the time nobody thought very much of this this was fairly normal procedure um and everyone was sort of reeling from the death of Arthur so uh Henry goes on to become king uh it's all okay and they have um, a single daughter who is Mary but um pretty much everyone, and there's a long list of people who try to have children with Henry. Um, this nearly always doesn't end well. Everyone has miscarriage after miscarriage after miscarriage, which suggests there's something genetically that's a bit wonky going on, um, that very, very few pregnancies were viable. Um, but, and this is true like of everybody, um, everyone has miscarriages, Catherine and yeah. Um, so we don't entirely know what's going on, but obviously something is. And uh, yeah, as time goes on and Catherine gets older, uh, no more children are forthcoming and specifically there is no son. And precisely because their dynasty was a baby dynasty and because there were lots of other people kicking around who had a claim to the throne, he was really worried about this. And um, eventually, uh, and this is, Henry is very, very good at rationalizing what he wants to do at the time, but, um, he had also fallen passionately in, in love with uh, a young woman by the name of Anne Boleyn, who was the daughter of a, a East Anglian, a Norfolk nobleman. Um, and this is called the King's Great Matter, this desire to divorce his wife of 30 years and marry Anne. Now, ordinarily, for the sake of a son and for the sake of the peace of the realm, the papacy would have said yes, However, at the time, in the 1520s, the papacy was actually getting literally besieged by Catherine's nephew, who is Charles V, who is 
the Holy Roman Emperor. In other words, um, the, the papacy literally has Catherine's nephew standing outside his bedroom window, um, which means he was not <coughs> going to sign a paper allowing Henry to divorce Catherine. So political, the short-term version of this is political factors intervene to make divorce impossible. <coughs> Henry is back to square one. Um, at this point is, is actively desperate and convinces himself, again, through rationalization or whatever else you choose, that he has committed somehow by marrying his brother's wife, he has committed incest and God is punishing him. Um, this is the rationalization at least he offers to himself uh, for this. Have anyone read Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall? A couple of you? Yeah, yeah. Um, she's very good with this stuff. Um, the sort of personalities. And ultimately, um, ultimately, uh, his chief minister, um, whose name is Thomas Cromwell, <laughs> pairs up with uh, um, pairs up with Henry to figure out how to uh, divorce Catherine and marry Anne. Um, Anne's father's chaplain was a young man by the name of Thomas Cramer. Um, this was the only job basically he had before he was catapulted to be Archbishop of Canterbury under Henry and as part of this new thing. And Cranmer and Anne and Thomas Cromwell are this sort of Protestant trinity of people working together in the early um, 1530s. And in 1534, they pass what is called the Act of Supremacy, which is a big fancy name that just basically says Henry has broken with the church in Rome and makes himself the head of the church, which sounds exactly like Nicaea. And I thought it was actually interesting if you watch the coronation, one of the things they did um, precisely because Prince Philip was Greek, you know, originally, we don't forget this. Prince Greek. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he, he is his, so they had an Orthodox choir. Uh, saying, which was, which was, which was interesting. They, um, well. they did, they mm -hmm. did. So, um, yeah, the, the English church has always had, so they're Protestants um, by background, but because the king is such an important part of the church of England, there is always this weird synergy with the Eastern church because, because again, you have that sort of Nicene system of king, bishops, you know, the king is still centrally important, and so are bishops uh, within that system. And it reminds people all the time um, of that older world. Uh, so whether they play with us is not so much an issue, but we like to think that we play with them. <laughs> um, uh, so it is interesting, and it comes back in sort of weird ways. So uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting to see, uh, to see the Orthodox. Is, you see is the your... English church or the Episcopal church, or is there a difference between the two? Uh, next week we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, they are they are part of a broader thing called the Anglican Communion, but they're 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 slightly different bodies. Um, but we'll come we may come back and talk about that a bit. It's less important for you, but it's it's my life rather than yours. <laughs> if that makes any sense. We are loosely affiliated, is the short version, um, but largely largely independent. Yeah, so here we go. We have Henry VIII um, with. Uh, who has finally succeeded in marrying Anne, um, who has a daughter, who is Elizabeth. Um, and, and Cranmer is his archbishop. Cranmer, actually, ironically, is much closer to Zwingli and to later on to Calvin than he is actually to Henry himself. Um, Cranmer actually is a memorialist when it comes to the Eucharist. Um, he's quite low church in terms of what he wants to have happen. <laughs> The problem is he's got a king who, having got what he wants, doesn't want anything else to change. And this is going to be the problem with the English Reformation from here on out, is that, is that you've got people who have ideas, <laughs> um, but they run smack into royal authority, which actually doesn't want anything to change at all. And so there's real tension between people's desire for religious reform and the political considerations that are just sitting on top of them and what they can actually do. Famously, of course, so Anne Boleyn, miscarriage after miscarriage after miscarriage later, is also not having a son. Um, to make a long story short, um, Henry will ultimately accuse her of well, many things, um, witchcraft, adultery, and lots of other things, and will have her beheaded. 
it will be the wife after uh, Anne, um, Jane Seymour, who will have uh, the son, um, Edward VI, and she will die of complications in childbirth shortly after um, bearing him. So uh, again, to make a long story short, Henry drags on to 1547 um, in, again, like Martin Luther, uh, also probably not terribly mentally stable, um, but, uh, and he will be succeeded by his son, Edward VI, who is quite young. Uh, when, during the five years of Edward's reign is when our friend Thomas Cranmer finally gets to have the Protestant Reformation he had always wanted to have. Um, and it will be under Edward VI that uh, he mm. will produce in first in 1549 and then in 1552, the so-called Book of Common Prayer, mm. which is the thing that, that, again, that I live with and you don't have to. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the Book of Common Prayer which is uh, central within Anglican worship. It's much more biblical than you might think. There's a lot of Bible in the BCP. Um, it's a collection of the Psalters in there, the full Psalters in there, as well as various other um, rites and prayers and collects that are all, all in this. And it's designed to regulate worship. It's written in the vernacular. So that would have been, again, so part of the Reformation project. Um, there's a lot of scripture in it. At the same time, it is a royally commissioned book that everybody had to have. So again, you have the tensions between both the sort of bottom up, everybody gets one, or like, or at least every church is supposed to have one, and yet it is royally uh, constrained. Our friend Tyndale, who had translated mm -hmm. the Bible, didn't approve of Henry's divorce. And as a result, Henry will have him executed in a Dutch prison. Um, and then they, then they turn around, steal Tyndale's Bible, and copy it to produce what's called the Great Bible, which is the first translation uh, of the of the Bible available. So, so the English Reformation is a story of people trying to have their cake needed to with the Reformation, both mm -hmm. of doing these things that look and feel quite um, Reformation e, but then all within this context of royal authority, royal control, and making sure that it doesn't get out of hand, or at least as they understood it. But um, those anarchic bottom-up elements from the Reformation are always there, um, are always there. And so after, so Edward will die unexpectedly in 1553, the country goes Catholic for five years, um, but then ultimately will be succeeded by um, Elizabeth, who has a nice long reign, which will allow, in a weird way, Elizabeth and her father are not that different. They likewise, fundamentally are Protestant. So again, if you watch the coronation, um, you may have been, you may have noticed all the oaths that Charles had to take about like protecting the Protestant mm -hmm. religion. They were very clear about this. Uh, so um, this is the so-called Elizabethan settlement. You may have heard that language of settlement um, throughout the coronation. Um, so the decision is fundamentally England would be Protestant, but, but Protestant on Elizabeth's terms, which sounded often a lot like her father's terms which was just not Protestant enough <laughs> for a lot of the people who would become the Puritans. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is where we'll pick up the story, I think, next Ooh. time. Um, <laughs> and it's the Puritans really who, through Calvin Knox, and you know, this is, this is where a lot of this history um, comes from. But I think we'll start here for questions because we've got, yeah. Actually, I think you can add croissants to your coffee. Uh -huh. Because um, in Venice, during the, you mm -hmm. give me the link here that it was then a uh, Muslim oh, yeah, yeah, state, mm -hmm. and a baker in that city created a croissant, which is shaped in the crescent, because it was Muslim. So, oh, I certainly hope that's Add some coffee, add some croissant to the coffee. I'm sure the French would love to know that there's some French <laughs> breakfast is actually, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So his name is um, Mehmet the Conqueror, Mehmet the um, Second. Yeah. Uh, he got his uh, religion from Saudi Arabia. Who's the leader of Islam? So, so this is one of those interesting things. So, uh, so um, uh, followers of the Prophet Muhammad, but, 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 but this is way before. Um, this is way before. So we think of. Um, Islam is being very Saudi centered now, but that to some extent is a modern thing. Um, at the time, 
uh, actually Islam was much less um, Saudi centric. So the capital from 750 was Damascus. It's one of the reasons the civil war is so sad. Uh, and then the capital was Baghdad for centuries. So the, um, the Muslim world was uh, quite complicated and quite regional um, also. And so the Mehmet the Conqueror has this sort of claim and he will make the claim to be caliph for the sort of head Muslim in Sunni, uh, in Sunni territory for much of the duration. So Constantinople or Istanbul is, um, you know, made the claim to be the sort of chief Muslim city for centuries. But the problem from the Saudi perspective, of course, is that there are lots of Christians in Constantinople, still are Greek Christians, but also there are lots of Jews. <coughs> um, Constantinople or um, Istanbul has always been an incredibly diverse city. And for the, for the fundies, that is not a terribly nice thing. So there's always been this tension between Mehmet and the claims of that dynasty versus, um, versus the sort of purists who uh, the Wahhabists and such who sort of take over within Islam. There's an interesting series, I believe it's on Netflix, about the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 such a it's such a it's like a properly complicated story. <laughs> I wish I knew more about it than I do. Um, yeah, the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Mehmet, did he conquer all of Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco? All that. I'm trying part. to think how far over he got. He mainly was concerned with capturing Constantinople. I'm trying to think how far over they go. Um, Egypt has always kind of had a mind of its own, um, religiously, as well as linguistically. I'm trying to think if they go over Egypt. They do eventually. Yeah, yeah, they do. They do. They get over there. I'm just trying to think when that is. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> they, they took over okay. Egypt. They did. But, but then the Janissaries That's right. intended to be Albanian. That's right. Um, they formed, they, they had a coup in Egypt. And so that's why they're Egyptian royal family was basically Albanian. Yep. And then in the early 19th century, <laughs> they marched all the way up toward Istanbul to conquer it, but they stopped by the British Navy. <laughs> and uh, and it sort of settled. We just forget how diverse the, the Ottoman world was. I mean, it's just incredibly, yeah. <clears throat> Just to bring it back to the Reformation, we learned a lot in Scotland about the contentious relationship between John Knox and uh, Queen Elizabeth I. Yes. So yeah, we should, we have to mention the um, we have to so so Knox um, was a actually lived a lot of his life on the continent um, and so was one of these Protestants that was going back and forth. Spent a lot of time in Switzerland. Um, uh, but the irony, poor Knox. So he really, really, really didn't like Mary Stuart, who married Queen of Scots. Um, for, for many reasons, partly because she was Catholic uh, and, and saw her as the sort of enemy of, of good religion. Partly Mary, bless her, had awful taste in men. Um, <laughs> and so didn't like uh, either the men who would, who would be James the first father or, and then certainly Bothwell uh, ultimately will get her thrown out of Scotland. So she crosses the border into um, England where she becomes Elizabeth's uh, prisoner basically for the rest of her life. Um, so he was mad. There's this like weird confluence of dynasties where I think at the same time we had Mary in Scotland, we had Elizabeth, and then over in France, I think it's, yeah, it's also Catherine he's mad at, Catherine de Medici in Paris. So we had like three queens at the same time. So he publishes a very famous treatise um, called Against the, as a, the, the Monstrous Regiment of Women, no, First Blast of the Trumpet Against the Monstrous Regiment of Women. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it's not really Elizabeth he's mad at, it's mainly Mary, but the problem is, is having put it in print, he can't take it out of print, and Elizabeth, you know, since it was basically a get rid of him, um, Elizabeth understandably saw this as more or less as high treason, which meant that Knox had to spend, again, more of his life in exile than he maybe intended. Um, but yeah, I think he actually would have liked to have gotten on with Elizabeth, but she, at that point, didn't want to get on with him. Um, so, yeah, but you'll still hear like people, you know, monstrous regiment is sort of a phrase that you hear, yeah, for just sudden hysterical, oh my God, there are too many women. Um, <laughs> so Calvin is interesting. Um, his given name is Jean Covin, he's French. We don't think of Calvin as French, do we? We associate him with Switzerland, but he's, he's very French. Um, Calvin, uh, he's from Picardy, um, but he's very French. Um, he will end up 
in through, again, a chain of circumstances, you will end up in Geneva, which if you know where Geneva is in Switzerland, is right over the French border. Um, so Switzerland, because of the Alps, uh, is very, obviously many, lang many languages spoken. And because of the way the mountains work, whatever border they're closest to is sort of the bit of Switzerland sort of mimics the country that's just over the border. And Geneva is very French. And Calvin, so what do you call a French Protestant? <laughs> Huguenot, a Huguenot, Huguenot. So um, uh, one of the questions I had to answer when I was in grad school for my exams was why did England go Protestant and France didn't? Um, <laughs> it's, it's more complicated than you would think. <laughs> yes, the short answer is it's complicated, but um, I think the thing that, that, you know, so much of French identity is, and we were Catholic, um, but actually, of course, that wasn't true. It wasn't inevitable. There were a lot of Catholic, there were, sorry, there were a lot of Huguenots in France, partly because from Geneva, Calvin and the circle of a lot of them were printers. Um, Calvin, as much as Luther, is really good at getting his works in print and out there for the general public. And a lot of French Huguenot were artisans. They, they would become, wherever they go, they're, they're silk makers often, but they're very good with little fine machinery, which means they're quite good with printing presses. Um, so Huguenot were very literate, very educated, um, and Calvin had a ring of them in Geneva, and they basically, so all of his institutes are in French, every version of them, there are several of them that are produced, they're all in French, uh, which means everybody could read them. Uh, and he's, there's all this stuff that's pouring sort of over the border into France. One of the reasons France doesn't go, um, doesn't go Huguenot is um, actually the, the nature of its capital city. Uh, in England, a lot of the evangelicals or Protestants are based in London. Uh, that's London actually becomes sort of a, uh, a center of English uh, religious identity. It's often people in the provinces who stayed Catholic, quote unquote. Um, but, uh, but yeah, within the capital city, within London, people were much more evangelical. In France, it's the other way around. It's the people in the provinces, the Huguenots, who are... Who are um, who are Protestant, but Paris is uber, uber, uber Catholic. So partly because the capital city, the capital city helps determine the shape or the fate of the nation as a whole. Um, some of it also has to do with politics. France has a really, really nasty um, civil war, basically, um, succession crisis of their own, uh, which is yucky. Um, but yeah, so Calvin, um, Calvin is, is another one who travels all over Europe. He's in Geneva twice, uh, and he's in Germany for part of the time. Calvin is a hard one to get to know. Again, I don't know how much of Calvin you guys have to learn about. Um, lots. Rebecca says lots. Uh, <laughs> in Rebecca's life, she has lots of Calvin. Um, yeah, the institutes are, Calvin was a lawyer by training, and it shows. He is a very systematic thinker. Um, and his legacy, the legacy really to, to Presbyterians everywhere, among other things, is that uh, the Presbyterian tradition does systematic theology really, really well. Um, to such an extent that, that a Presbyterian systematics is kind of the default for American religion, um, including in the Anglican tradition, um, the Episcopal Church, for reasons which we'll talk about next time. Um, but, but yeah, so Calvin is... When we think of systematic theology, when we think of theology as a discipline as we know it now, a lot of that comes from Calvin um, because he was just absolutely <laughs> relentless uh, in terms of, but yeah, but the, but the institutes are an incredibly impressive piece of work. Um, and he's quite consistent. I mean, he has several editions, but the core of it stays the same pretty much across editions. So yeah, he is a, he is a world, is our friend Calvin. Um, yeah, so I'll pause there, I think. Um, okay, let's just before we go, because we're done. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck.